said? Yeah, so. Okay, so um, as I said earlier, uh, my name's Monica and I teach at the Center of Geographic Sciences, better known as COGS. And so we've been around for a lot of years. We started out as um, a survey institute and uh, branched out into mapping and uh, there's a whole history there for sure. And um, my, I teach uh, primarily in the Geographic Sciences program, which is a two-year diploma program. So the students come to us, they do a common foundation year in um, what we call Geographic Sciences, but essentially they get a taste or foundation in cartography, GIS, remote sensing, community environmental planning, all the good stuff that you need to know to be successful working in the industry. So <clears throat> some of the courses that I teach, so then once you finish that first year successfully, then you can choose one of four concentrations. So remote sensing cartography, my favorite, GIS and uh, community environmental planning. So uh, that is a great model, but we, as a lot of the educators in the room, and how many educators do we have? If I can just kind of see. So we have a few still. Okay, so uh, a lot of us are struggling with dwindling numbers and trying to attract more students. And it's, it's for a lot of reasons, more competition in, in teaching institutes. I think um, just aging population and um, lots of stuff. Anyway, so we didn't have a cartography concentration last year, so Monica, the cartographer, ended up with a new courses. So I ended up teaching two courses that were new to me. One was an enterprise GIS course and a spatial database course. So I thought, great. <laughs> and if you've ever taught before, you kind of think you get these new courses and you think, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? I'm not necessarily the subject matter expert. So um, one of the things that we like to do at COGS, and um, if anybody, and also if you have taught, there's nothing worse than standing in front of students and with a bunch of PowerPoint slides and having them be completely disengaged in what you're trying to teach them. So um, my teaching philosophy is really to try to get them engaged. I mean, certainly there is going to be a lot of that hand-holding at some point, but I really try to get projects to make the every every step along the way in courses that I'm facilitating uh, a part of an experience where the students are working with a client or doing real-world projects. And so this is one um, that kind of came together by my friend Marcel. And if you've not seen Marcel's work, Marcel Moran, and so he goes by Lost Art Cartography, and um, he lives in Grand Pre. And this is one of Marcel's maps. <coughs> and. Um, he is also on the board for the Annapolis Valley Trails Coalition. And so he's been pestering me for a couple years. Monica, I'm on this board for the Trails Coalition, and this Rick Jakes, this trail coordinator, he has all this data, and he has, it's just a mess. It's all in boxes. It's in his basement. And what are we going to do? Can you work on this? Because he doesn't. They don't have a budget. So I said, well, Marcel, let me just kind of plan, I'll just kind of file it. I don't have anything now, um, and this was a couple years ago, but just leave it with me and I'll see what I can find. So fast forward or, you know, come back to fall or a year ago when I got these courses that I had to teach and I thought, ha, ah, there's what I'm going to do. We're going to build a GIS for the Annapolis Valley Trails Coalition, and so that's what we did. So um, I initially met with Marcel last year and kind of got, you know, got the initial client meeting to find out like their needs assessment and what it was that they needed and uh, started putting some, some ideas together with Marcel. And one of the things that Marcel wanted, of course, Marcel is all about the end product. Why, how can we tell the story and make things look great and because he is, he's a, he's a fat fantastic cartographer. And so one of the things that he said is that we want to have, not only do we need to manage the data and manage the assets for the trails group, we need to make Rick Jakes, the trail coordinator, we need to make his life a little bit easier so that when he's working in the field that he doesn't have to have his pencil and paper and his voice recorder and bear spray because he gets chased by bears and all this kind of stuff. But we need to make it so that it's a little bit easier for him to manage all this data. But also, Marcel, the cartographer, he's like, we'd like to be able to take the data and be able to build a web map 
um, similar to the Rum Runners Trail. So this is a web map. I think it's done by a fella. I can't remember right off the top of my head who, who the cartographer is for this one. But this is kind of Marcel's vision. This is a prototype of where eventually where we want to get to with this, with this data set uh, for the trail. So um, this is a, uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about the process and the, where we kind of got with this project and where we hope to go in future courses that I hope to facilitate uh, with some of our COG students uh, in the next semester. So this is, this is uh, just kind of a view that I took. This is, uh, Roger, you get to hike on the trail or walk on the trail with my dog, but it's a beautiful trail. It runs um, down through the Annapolis Valley. Um, and uh, uh, it's just a great place. It used to be the old CN rail line, and so they ripped it up, and now it's owned by Lands and Forests, and it's just this wonderful trail. Um, and so the Annapolis Valley Trails Coalition, they are just one stakeholder that is part of this, this group that maintains the trail. And um, we kind of, uh, let me just see if I can find this picture. So Cass, so my students put this together in the Cascade style is not always easy to present. So, okay, so here we go. We've got 110 kilometers of trail that, that Rick is responsible for maintaining. And it's all done, the maintenance is all done on a volunteer basis. So uh, they've got 22 managing entities, some of which are also towns and municipalities who help along with that. So here's a look at the road crew going through. Just to give you an idea, like they, they really don't have a lot of budgets. They write grants to, to do any of the maintenance or upgrades. And um, <clears throat> he, Rick told us that with a lot of, we've had a lot of storm damage recently with climate change and that kind of thing. A lot of washouts. They spend like $30,000 just like within a month just in upgrading the trail to keep it going. So this is a, also some of Marcel's work where he's, he did some wayfinding signage, uh, did the design for that, and that's also located on the, along the trail. So some of the assets that we Rick identified as being uh, pieces that we, he wanted to maintain, and this is just really one portion. This isn't even talking about the whole piece with the tourist side of things and going, getting to the point where we could build that Rum Runners or Annapolis Valley Trails Coalition Trail. But for Rick, for managing the trail, he's really interested in destination signs, bridges, culverts, regulatory signs are really important to him. And so, does anybody have any data that kind of looks like this? So when I first met Rick, this is what he brought into me. He said, this is, this is my data. And when I, when I first talked to Marcel, I, I was kind of picturing what Roger's office looked like, and, um, where the papers are everywhere and all scattered. So this is quite organized. So Rick, even though he, he does appear to be a little bit scattered, and here's a picture of him here, but he just has, he has too many hats. And uh, he's just doing way too much. So um, I was quite relieved when he brought this in and everything is very organized. So he's got, um, what he does is he goes out and he has to inspect bridges, he has to inspect culverts, and they're all very organized on um, Excel spreadsheets. So here are my students, Chris Doyle and Nicole White, and so really big uh, GIS class. And so we kind of, we treated this as a client project. We worked as a team. We, we first met with Rick, even though I knew what was up. Uh, we treated it exactly like they got this contract. It's up to them to kind of work through it. And through that, we learned all the concepts of building a GIS <coughs> and a spatial database. So some of the things that he was looking for, what most GIS users are looking for, you know, efficiently querying, scalability, able to update in the field, you know, pie in the sky, having some kind of portal interface. Now, now keep in mind, I only have these students for six hours a week, so I'm pretty ambitious. So I know Sean Lackey, you've, you've had me as a teacher. I can kind of be a little bit over the top. And, uh, it, you know, that's not a lot of time to do this kind of work with the data that we had. So first step, we, we had to identify some key things, because we knew we didn't have time to do everything. Um, so we said, well, we want to make sure we get the geometries and the attributes correct for the trail segment itself. They're really keen to be able to map the user count so that they can go and say, hey, look, Grand Prix, this is the amount of users that you have. 
and uh, you need to contribute a bit more or whatever it might be. So culverts and bridges and sign attributes and inspection details were really key for Rick to be able to help maintain his, uh, his project. So we came up with some deliverables of what we wanted to give to the client. So we wanted to give them a multi-user GIS, um, <coughs> merge some of this uh, disparate da uh, data sources, <laughs> and uh, find an effective way for Rick to be able to store his data and query it. And hopefully, you know, like in all GIS, we wanted to definitely improve the efficiency and be able to share this data with all of those different stakeholders and have other people contribute. So have it not just be Rick's data, but also the group or all the trail users as well. So first thing we did, like anybody would do, any teacher, we did some industry research and we met with uh, Trevor Robar, who um, is with, he does, he's a, he's a COGS grad, he works for the town of Wolfville, but he also is CEO of Landmark Geographic uh, Solutions. And so uh, Trevor has a lot of experience working and building trail GIS systems. So he spent a little bit of an afternoon talking with the students and telling them all about, you know, what to expect working with clients and how to kind of manage this project. So that was great. So then we kind of did like what Scott did in the workshop and we hashed out what this might look like, keeping in mind that this project, we kind of two things. I have to, um, we know that the client doesn't have a lot of money, has no money really to do this. And also that the students, need to get experience and build their skills in not only just open source, but also proprietary as we software, because at COGS, that's, that's one of our main applications that we use. So we kind of had to kind of look at it that like, I had to kind of make sure that the students weren't just getting all just one GIS, and kind of wanted to make sure they had experience in a lot. So we talked out, how do we get to that run runner's trail, and what would that look like? Um, and, and in terms of managing all those files of data. And so uh, we, we talked about everything from being able to build a database to taking that into our desktop, um, being able to pull that out of desktop and use ArcGIS Collector or QField and go in the field to collect data. How do we get that data back into the database? and then uh, serve that up as a web map service or whatever it might be. So we kind of brainstormed a bit, came up with a plan about how we were going to approach this project and manage it within the time that we had. So we'd, we brainstormed, we decided we, well we knew we had to do a spatial database, uh, desktop GIS client, whether that would be open source or ArcGIS Pro is what we used. We wanted to explore some field mobility maps because we knew Rick is in the field and he needed a better solution for that. And uh, maybe, maybe he has some time to look at cloud-based storage of the spatial data and then eventually web maps and portals. So we didn't necessarily get to all that, but we did kind of explore quite a bit of it. So first thing was how do we, which way do we go? Do we go proprietary? And we kind of, the students kind of hashed out what we, we'd be looking at, you know? so. One thing to consider in all this, like Rick, he's got basic GIS experience, he's got Q on his computer, and so he can, he can kind of open it up and find stuff, but we knew it needed to be easy to use. But then on the other side, we also had to think about all these 22 stakeholders, and most of the municipalities in Nova Scotia are using Esri software. So we knew, you know, it needed to be something that's going to be able to um, get data back and forth. So we came up with a project plan, we identified some milestones of targets for our deadlines, just like you would in industry, and we approached it kind of with an agile scrum kind of um, pro uh, method of project management. So we kind of, we would meet on the Monday, we'd pick a task, we'd work on it, we'd come back the next week, show our results, troubleshoot together, and I'm involved, like, a, instead of me being up there teaching, we either go over the concepts that they needed to learn along the way, um, but we would kind of troubleshoot together, and so I learned a lot of stuff from my students, and they learned stuff from me, so it was really a two-way teaching um, project that was, it was really great. So we tried to get as much done as we could, we worked collaboratively, we, um, contacted the client as we needed to, and we also had like an intermediate meeting in the middle, like October, just to kind of give the client an update about where we were and where we were hoping to go. So we decided to build the database in um, using Postgres, 
uh, with the post-GIS extension. And so that meant we had to sit down with all of those key things and build an entity relationship diagram. And so when you see, now this is just for the, those five pieces of uh, key thing, key assets that Rick wanted to manage. So culverts, bridges, the trail itself, and uh, what else did we have? I can't even remember it off the top of my head. But this is the monster that we had to build. <laughs> and so we broke it out into schema. So you guys were looking at a public schema um, um, with Scott. So we just, those schemas essentially are thematic uh, ways of managing the data thematically. So anyway, whether it was the right way to do it or not, I don't know. Anyway, it seemed to work okay. So each one of us, so I even participated. I took one chunk, I did some signs. And uh, Nicole and Chris, they kind of hashed out and normalized the data to make this, we wanted to make the database as efficient as possible. So all along the way, of course, we're really um, trying to like, really hit home to the students about the importance, like Chris was talking about earlier, everybody's been talking about the importance of data integrity and the importance of those attributes. So um, this entity relationship diagram was really our roadmap to building and putting this database together. <clears throat> So once we, that was the hard part, once we get that all figured out, then it was just a matter of building the database, importing it into Postgres, and then if you've ever done it, it's really easy. So we connected it to ArcGIS Pro. So here's a look at the Postgres database, here's a look at the assets here, we've got our bridges, our trails, all right within the ArcGIS Pro, we can query it, we can create new views, export out pieces, and all that kind of stuff. And then we can also do it the same thing, we can do the same thing in QGIS. So all along the way, we're kind of testing both platforms just to see how it looks. So this is just one of the monster queries that, uh, that we did. <laughs> it gets a little fun when you start working with schemas with the queries. So, so then we, we, we spent a little bit of time exploring some mobile support. And uh, so one that we looked at on the Android side of things um, was QField. And so that's really like working with a Q file on your phone and uh, taking it out and bringing it back. We, uh, we also explored ArcGIS Collector to see how we could get it. So this also included a piece where you had to get stuff into ArcGIS Online, so a whole other component of managing the data in WebGIS. And we don't necessarily have all the, the complete workflow sorted out or ironed out, but we've got a good start to it. Um, we talked about, we looked at, you know, what kind of external GNSS receivers might be something that the coalition could look at. So at COGS we have um, um, Trimble R1, and that gives pretty good accuracy, submeter on a good day. And then this guy over here is a little bad elf. Um, the students didn't actually get to play with that, but I do have a friend who's working with one of those doing orienteering. Uh, data collection and he, it's it's a little bit tricky to get it to work, but he, it's not bad at all. So good accuracy. So looking at you know comparing the hardware that this uh, group might need. So looking at the prices and costing it all out. So then here's a little web map. This is what the data. So then the students. The next phase was to let's see what the, it would look like in um, a web map. So this is just just a quick web map of the trail. Oops, done in. Um, fed in from ArcGIS Online, we, we've got, they wanted, we wanted to show user counts in this case. And so you can see in this, the trail is more used um, at the uh, uh, eastern side uh, of the trail itself. Okay, and then Nicole, she's, uh, so Chris, he enjoyed working with the Esri stuff, and Nicole really liked working with open source. Now, this isn't a live map. I don't have it, uh, I don't have it up on a server at the moment. But she took it and took it in a leaflet and, um, and kind of built the beginnings of what the Rum Runners Trail could look like, essentially, in there. And so with that, she made a prototype uh, leaflet JavaScript map. Uh, this is just some of her code in there and what it could look like with the pop-up. Um, so then we established some next steps. So the real cool thing about this is that the students, they, they went, uh, we got kind of storm stayed, or stormed out, we didn't get to present this, but uh, we had a meeting, the students went in front of uh, some of those stakeholders and they presented the project to, um, <coughs> to the board and everybody thought it was great. And the best part about it is really about 
um, getting all the stakeholders in one room and getting them to talk about, hey, let's let's work together because a lot of the time it's really just kind of Rick just trying to manage the assets all on its own. So that was, you know, the data and the mapping is one thing, but trying to get everybody to talk together, that was that was that was golden to me. And uh, so next steps. I'm kind of in my mind, I kind of envision this as being like a five-year project maybe. I've got some students coming in. I'm going to have one, at least one of these courses again in the fall, and I hope to continue working on it. So we've got to look at some, you know, maybe refining the database, bringing in new schemas into that. Um, and then maybe now that I'm going to have some Cardo students next year is how can we make some meaningful web maps? How can we create that Rum Runners trail? So maybe next year I'll be back presenting some student work or have some students presenting, you know, a, a, a nice map showing some of that trail data with some assets um, for the actual end user. Um, how do we automate some of those repetitive workflows? So those are all things that we're kind of looking at. So yeah, so that's the project uh, that we worked on. So that's it. We've got time for one question. Uh, forgive my ignorance as a newbie, but the triple device, $2,500, and I don't know what it costs. Um, again, my ignorance. Why couldn't you use the GPS on an iPhone or something like that? And sure. So if, if you use the GPS on your iPhone currently, you can you get about, they say, 8 to 10 meters accuracy. It really depends on the cell network. Um, so you pair it through Bluetooth with one of these little devices, and they're, they're coming down in price as time goes on. So eventually they're going to get cheaper. And so that allows you to get better accuracy. So again, we had the same, Andy, we had the same debate. Does Rick really need centimeter accuracy or I mean meter accuracy to be able to you know map a culvert um, but uh, 10 meter maybe not, you know for mapping culverts might not be the best option so so yeah I, I was using the trails app on, yep. and to map a sled trail this winter and I was then look, laying it over a satellite you know OSM image and I was stunned at the accuracy oh yeah for it's sure way better than 10 meters yeah and part of that, including that, was to get the students to think about the hardware side of the, the, yeah. the GIS infrastructure as well. So yeah. not necessarily recommending that Rick needs to buy it, but more just getting them to think about yeah. all the solutions that are available. For my thing, I'm looking for the cheapest way to get a lot Absolutely. Of yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Hey, thanks, Monica. Thanks, Mark.